Well, I'm not sure when you're going to be viewing this, but it's good morning from me anyway. I've had on my heart for some time the story of Elijah, and it's a bit long to put into one long talk. So what I've done is split it into three sections. Um, and each one should stand alone, so you can watch it by itself. But it will refer back to a previous bit as we go along, so uh, it's worth doing them in order. Um, the first bit is just to remind people about the beginning of the story of Elijah. Um, John King covered this back in August, um, and his talk is on the church website and the media section, um, so it's well worth having a proper listen to that because I'm going to go over it quite quickly. Okay, so I want to set the scene. Um, the king at the time is King Ahab and he has led the people of Israel away to idolatry and um, all sorts of wrong things that they're doing against the real God, Yahweh. Um, and Elijah appears, 1 Kings chapter 18, um, it says he's from Tishbe, he's a Tishbite, um, and he comes to Ahab and challenges him and says, you are doing wrong, you're doing idolatrous things. There will be no rain in Israel for the next few years until I give the word. And then he disappears. And we find out later that Ahab and his wife Jezebel go looking for him everywhere and they can't find him. That's because first of all he is hidden by God in a ravine called Kerith where ravens come and feed him which doesn't sound very delicious to me but um, if you're hungry um, fine. Um, there was water there, there was food from the ravens and that kept him alive uh, until the water dried up. Then he went to a town called Zarephath where a widow um, was miraculously given um, the ability to feed not only her own, her own family but him as well because um, she was on the point of, of dying at that at that stage because uh, there hadn't been any food and there was a, a terrible drought. Um, and after about three years Elijah feels that God's telling him to go and confront Ahab um, and so he does he meets a chap called Obadiah who's a faithful follower of God and Obadiah tells Ahab um, and they meet up and Elijah tells Ahab that he wants to have a confrontation between the real God and Baal the idolatrous God which Ahab and Jezebel have been leading the people of Israel to worship instead. And the scene shifts to Mount Carmel. Um, and at Mount Carmel, um, there are two sacrifices made. First of all, the priests of Baal um, try and get their God to answer by fire from heaven to light up the sacrifice. There's no lighting of the sacrifice allowed you have to prepare the sacrifice, put it on the altar, and then the true God will answer by fire. And the prophets of Baal try all day and fail. And then Elijah gathers the people together and gets them to build up the altar of God. Um, and then he pours water in vast quantities over the sacrifice just to make sure that everybody knows that any fire that comes down is really from God. Um, and then he prays to God and God answers by fire and burns up the sacrifice. And you can see that this is Elijah's dream in a sense. He has shown that the real God, the one who answers by fire, is the great one and the real one. And that Baal is not the real God. And the people take the prophets of Baal and they kill them. Um, and Elijah then tells Ahab to get on with doing some feasting, but he still has work to do. He goes and prays and intercedes at the top of Mount Carmel, 
um, and sends his servant to keep an eye out for rain clouds and when a tiny rain cloud appears in the distance Elijah goes to Ahab the king and says watch out it's going to rain soon you better get moving um, and then very soon the rain comes and it says that Elijah ran in front of Ahab's chariot all the way to Jezreel which is about nearly 20 miles not quite as far as that um, so Elijah's filled with God's spirit and able to do that and this is a time of triumph Elijah has wanted to turn the people of Israel back to the real God to Yahweh um, and it feels as if he's done that he's demonstrated that the real God answers by fire um, he's brought back rain by his prayers and surely this is when his mission will be accomplished the mission that God's given to him and the people of Israel will turn back to the true God um, and this is a time of triumph I don't know if you are familiar with Rudyard Kipling's poem if but he says if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same and it turns out that Elijah his triumph is is not a real one um, it should have been but it isn't um, but this is a time of triumph this is a time when God appears to have answered all of Elijah's dreams and prayers all the things he's prayed for and everything is going to go okay and I think it's really worth us remembering those times when God has done great things for us it's worth us writing them down remembering them repeating them to one another throughout the Bible in the Old Testament you find people reminding one another about what God has done and they they do things to help remembering so Samuel sets up a stone called Ebenezer which means this far has God helped us um, and that stone is to remind people of God's help when the people of Israel crossed the Jordan um, right at the beginning to attack Jericho they set up 12 stones one for each tribe to remind them of God's miracle in parting the waters of the Jordan the Passover meal was something which um, God ordained he told them to remember their deliverance from Egypt every year by celebrating the Passover and there are many other examples through the Old Testament of people rem having to remember deliberately remember because we forget stuff don't we we forget when God's done great stuff for us and uh, we think oh it's all awful sometimes and we just need to remember those things the Israelites were told to write down the law, sentences from the laws, on their doorposts and in their houses. And I know some people do that. They have verses from God, promises from God, um, sort of blue tacked or pinned up around their house to remind them of God's promises and all his goodness. So I want to encourage you, first of all, at this end of this first bit of Elijah's story to remember what God has done for you whether it's bringing you to faith in the first place as uh, my story of faith um, the very beginning of it it was such a dramatic moment for me such a change in my life and I know that's true for many of us um, and it's really worth deliberately remembering those things that God has done for us so I'm just going to briefly pray. Father, thank you for the way that you sometimes dramatically and wonderfully answer prayers and you bring our, our long nurtured dreams to fruition. And Lord, we just want to thank you for those times. We want to thank you for bringing us to faith. Thank you for changing our lives and transforming our reality. And Lord, we want to thank you for all that you do faithfully for us and we want to deliberately remember those things help us to know for each one of us how to 
remember those things in a deliberate way and to remind ourselves of your goodness and your love and your grace. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, Amen.